feels good in here. Man. <laughs> I was uh, standing there and John started playing that harp. And something just went through me and all that tension that was inside of me. You kids can go. Go ahead. Go, 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 go. I had a, some concerns and some worries and all of a sudden it was disappeared. It just went, it was, it went away. It was gone. And I, and I can't even remember what it was. Who needs to remember? Maybe, maybe that was what was coming out of your toes. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it starts coming out everywhere. <laughs> but uh, praise and word, it should do that. It should free us and liberate us. And just like his love reaches to the heavens, our praise reaches to the heavens. Because I said, man, Lord, this feels good. I feel great. And he said, you know, that makes me feel like that too. Oh, yes. Thank you, Father. You know, he loves the praises of his people. He rejoices over us when we give praise and when we give honor and we laud his name and we worship him. Because what happens is that that thing that we all talk about, how it's all about the relationship and all that. See, that's when the interaction starts. When we get in his presence and we start feeling him and inviting him in and open up our heart and allow him just to come in as much as he wants. Oh, man. Somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> Father, you're welcome here. We just love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for your abiding spirit that just saturates this place right now. You are welcome. 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 Hallelujah. Bless you all. Thank you. Well, it felt like I've been gone for a while. Oh. Well, it's good to be back. Feeling a lot better. Uh, <laughs> let's see, where am I going to start tonight? Uh, I feel you, Lord. <laughs> he said I started a long time ago. <laughs> Well, anyway, <laughs> if it keeps increasing, I'm just going to have to sit down. <laughs> and anyway, uh, it is nice to go away and leave, uh, you know, leave the services in capable hands. And I heard Holy Spirit showed up, and God bless you, Mike. I don't know if Mark's here, and I don't see Mark. But anyway, uh, just amazing. I heard you guys had some good services. Uh, I was able to watch yours. That was... I saw you wave at me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, it, it, thanks for all your support. You guys mean the world to me, and I and I missed you too. I've, I've got a lot of we missed you, but I, I've missed you all too. Um, and I wanna, I wanna, kind of break into this. The word that God has given to me tonight is actually. I'm I'm just gonna tell you it's about fundamental stuff in building a church okay and some say well pastor didn't you start this ministry here years ago yeah I did but I never really thought about building a church I and still have a hard time saying it until last year though God began to put in my heart and see I evidently God had this whole plan all the time and and that doesn't mean I still won't call you guys tri a tribe Okay, because you are. Uh, but in order to build a self-sufficient, self-sustaining church, we're going to have to change some things. And there's some groundwork that I never really thought about and I didn't lay before. So sometimes I'm going to say things that's going to sound like somebody else. It's just not even going to sound like me, probably. It, can you deal with that? Yeah. Because I've taken a whole new mindset and then God begin, has begun to tell me I need you to do some things differently and I'm like it, here's the thought that went through my head man I've heard pastors do that and it drives me crazy but then all of a sudden I begin to realize well there's a reason why they do certain things because of what they're focused on that doesn't mean you know that we have to change and be like everybody else and and we're not special just because we're different either okay 
Uh, and the bottom line is, when I came here, my focus was always, and it has been for many years, and all of our teams that we send out is about going out to the streets, going out to the neighborhoods, going out to parks and going out to trailer parks and going out to apartment complexes and going out to homeless camps and going out to motorcycle events and going out to hospitals and wherever. And that whole idea about building a church and they will come, I think that whole idea came from a Hollywood movie, Build It and They Will Come. And I, that just never settled with me really well. Uh, you open your doors and then wait for everybody to come in. I think that people need to be compelled. What do you all think? Okay. So there are some things that our foundations that we've already laid, and that's never going to change. As a matter of fact, I want to do more and I want to go more. And I want to, you know, be available to people, maybe shut-ins or maybe people that, for some reason, they don't want to come back to a church because they've been victimized or something. Okay, so that stays the same. But also, I want to build something here, and we've got a pretty good start already. But I want to go back and talk about some things because it was my bad. Is that how they say that? <laughs> my mistake. Uh, so I'm going to be real blunt with this part of it. We're going to be talking about some things churches talk about a lot, okay? I, I don't think I have to do it like them. Because here's the thing, they're, they're, it, instead of throwing the word at people and saying, look, you better obey or else, that, that's not going to cut the ice. Because obedience comes out of a heart of love. We're just in worship. So, in other words, uh, to get people to begin to give and to tithe and to become obedient to the word, me slamming a bunch of scriptures in your face without laying some foundation for it, it it's just not going to work. Some people, that's why some people, when they just get the raw word, they get upset and they get mad, and they leave, and they take their money with them too. Um, listen, it's said out there that preachers are just after your money. Can I settle something once and for all? We are. Look, to have a thriving church and a nice ministry, you need a lot of money. God has known this from the very beginning. That's why you've got giving and tithing outside of the law. It existed long before the law. It, it started back in the beginning with the sons of Adam. But that's not even the first tithe that God had. Because in the Eden, he had a tithe and he said, don't touch that tree, that's mine. And when you understand tithe, that's what tithe is. That's mine. You can't pay you a tithe. And, and there's even a couple of scriptures that says pay your tithe. But basically, how can you pay something that's not yours? Okay. Uh, so you see where this is going. This is one of those foundational points. I'm going to lay some groundwork because I had a very gracious, anointed, awesome man of God come to me a while back. And he's one of my partners, one of my strong partners. And he tells me this. He says, Lonnie, I believe in you, and I believe in the ministries that you do and all, and all the stuff. And he goes, and I'll support those. But he says, your church needs to become self-sustaining. We do. We really do. So... This is why we're going to go back and lay some things. Do you, do you all think that this church, this, I feel weird even saying that, this tribe is worth preserving so we, we can go into the future? And we have had Liberty Towers, who has been so gracious to us almost, for a total of, I think, almost nine and a half years. Uh, that has brought us in. Now, you got to remember, this, this crazy, uh, whacked out, spirit-filled nut <laughs> coming together with, you know, other denominations that we, maybe we don't see. But they get, made a commitment to me many years ago. They go, because you do what you do, 
we're not going to get in your way, we're, but we believe in what you do, so we're going to support it. And they have. Okay? And Liberty Towers has a lot of great vision. They've got a lot of great goals for the future. As a matter of fact, unbeknownst to me, I met with some of my core group. It was over in the, in the cafeteria over here, or the kitchen, and we had a little quick meeting, and we talked about doing some things, and then I said, there's something I need to do because God has just recently, and this was last year, 2013, uh, and God has spoke to me about building the church. And uh, so I said, we, we need to do, make some changes and do some things. And one of those things was start what I coined power group. Have any of you ever heard of power group before? Huh? Out of this church, your power group. Are any of you involved in power group? Wow, quite a few of you. Well, the whole idea is... Say if we wanted to build a church of 500, that's a, that's a good, you know, 20, 25 power groups, probably. But why do you got to do a power group? Well, because the whole purpose of a power group, as a church begins to grow, it's like when you put yeast into the flour and what begins to happen. And that's what power group is all about, because you've got all these different little cells. And in a large church, you know, there's, there's, there's people here right now that, you know, I... You know, have you ever tried to come and say something to me at the end of the service? And that's probably one of the most accessible times for some of you, unless you're where I'm at during the week. Uh, and it's pretty hard for us to, you know, really communicate, especially after I've been under a heavy anointing. And you can tell me a story 30 minutes long, and I'm going to forget everything you said anyway. But in a power group setting, people can come together. They can set. They can talk. It's not just like Lonnie up there running his mouth for 45 minutes. People actually get to interact with each other right. in these home settings. They get to ask questions that maybe they've never gotten to ask before, but it's been in their heart just to talk something out and ask and see what kind of response they get. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to be heard? And in the power group setting, that happens. So the power groups is not about... You're getting another teaching on some other thing. And believe me, the leaders of the power groups, they're going to have a word. But they're not going to dominate that group with 45 minutes of what they have got to say because it's an interaction of the entire group. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. And you understood that too, Mike, didn't you? Rhonda, you understand that. Um, and then... When people begin to talk, things begin to surface and things begin to come out and needs begin to be made known because you're hearing, what an awesome time. You've got a laid back atmosphere in a house that's comfortable, setting with a bunch of people that you are getting to know intimately and Holy Spirit begins to show up and all of a sudden you realize, oh, you have a need. You need to be healed. You need to be set free. And the group comes together and begins to pray. And my, 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 Holy Spirit shows up. And that which was impossible begins to happen. People who didn't realize that they could just be set free in a moment. Let me tell you something. One minute of prayer is more powerful than 45 minutes of a preacher yakking at you because prayer changes things. Hey, don't take away from 45 minutes of anointed preaching because that's how people get saved, okay? That's how we get our start. How will they know unless somebody goes and tells them how lovely on the mountains are the feet of them that bring the good news? Okay, okay. we understand that. So, you understand how important this power group thing is. Very soon... We're going to have a few more because it's already starting to grow. You've, I've heard you guys have already started a small church over there. Is that right? Okay. So to keep it where everybody can interact and get to know each other, we're, we're going to have not. We're, we're not going to sit. We're not going to use that word split. We're going to use the word growth, just like yeast. You know, and that's why the bread blows up. That's why the beer blows up, too, by the way. 
I had to throw that in there. <laughs> anyway, yeast is doing its work. And, and, and in that setting, the Holy Spirit begins to, to work and, you, and, and, and you, get to, you get to know each other. And so as your church begins to grow, you still got that small group atmosphere in your church and everybody gets to know everybody. Isn't that a great idea? Well, here's what we didn't know. Last, what was it, two weeks ago? I'm sitting out in the foyer out here and I look at 20, 25, what does it say? What is Liberty Tower? 25 and 23 weeks. 25 and 23 weeks? They're doing the same thing. I think we started first, though. <laughs> because we started it on a, on a Wednesday and it, it hit on... But I think that, you know, knowing Pastor Terry, he probably had it planned the whole time. I mean, it's just, just the visionary man of God he is. But anyway, the, the amazing thing was that God put this all in our hearts at the same time to begin to grow our church and begin to lay more foundation. Now, back to what this whole... See, I've already wasted... What, I shouldn't say wasted. I've already been on this like for 10, 15 minutes. So we're going to go back to the tithe and the offerings. Is everybody okay? Nobody's jumped up and ran out uh, yet. Here's the thing. I was aggravated about some things and um, I was talking to God out loud. Any of you ever just talk to God out loud? You're just, you know... You're just sounding off. Oh, you do that too, huh? That's okay. God's a good listener. He will sit there, the one who has the answer, and let you go on all day long. Yeah. Remember, prayer is two-way communication. We should be listening more than we're speaking. You should be listening more than you're speaking. You should be listening more than you're speaking. Yes. Listening with those inner ears of the Spirit that God gives you. And sometimes things just have to be confirmed. Because I heard God say something to me and I was like shocked. Have anybody been shocked by what God says to you? And then you were like, behind me, Satan. Excuse me? That's like when the cross, when, you know, I pray, God, crucify me. Let the cross go to work in my life and oh, hell would break loose. What a bloody week. So I'd start rebuking Satan and God said, you cannot rebuke Satan and have the cross go, because you're getting something confused here. You're confusing the death of your old flesh with the works of Satan and it's the works of the cross. Right. Let me tell you something, the cross is very anti-flesh. Right. What I'm saying is very anti-old man. I think uh, Craig was kind of dancing on that a while ago. But let me tell you something. In Christ, that old man is dead. That's right. If you look under your bed, those of you who have came into the new creation, you are a new creation in Christ. The old man has gone. The new man has come. And you look under your bed. The old man's shoes shouldn't be parked under your bed anymore. Right. Who are you in bed with? There was two men in the bed. One was taken, and the other was left. And believe me, I hear a lot of preaching on that scripture, and boy, do they got that one backwards. There's always been two men in scripture. And when the one man is taken, there's one man that remains. And this is the new man. And he is fully alive in you. As a matter of fact, that's what makes you totally acceptable to God. In spite of how many uh, failures or victories that you've had. It's not based upon your performance. Going through a bunch of religious calisthenics don't make you no more holier. But it's totally your dependence upon Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loved you and gave himself for you. As a matter of fact... It, the entire life is about him. That's why the Apostle Paul said, It is no longer I that live, but Christ that live in me. Amen. And it's a faith walk. You know, it sounds so simple, doesn't it? Yet we struggle to hang on to the memories of the old man. And let that come back over and over again. Okay, getting back. See, I'm trying to avoid what I've got to confess to you. <sighs> Anyway, uh, now does that make sense? Everybody understanding that? 
In other words, if you've affected Jesus, you can't get no more saved than you're already saved. But is there room for improvement? The more you surrender to him, the more he'll come in. The more you open up your heart, he will fill your tabernacle. Let me tell you something. His train will fill the temple. He comes in and he can keep coming for eternity. There's no end to him. How much are you willing to open up and let him fill your temple? And don't, be mis don't have a misunderstanding about what the true temple is. The true temple. Jesus was crucified. For what they thought he said, not for what he actually said. Boy, isn't that the truth? He said, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. He's hanging on the cross. Okay, They all confused that, by the way. They were looking at the natural temple. He was speaking of himself. He's hanging on the cross. And they walked by and they were making fun of him and wagging their heads at him and said, Isn't this the one who said, destroy this temple and he will rebuild it in three days? He was in the middle of that destruction right there. Right. Talking about the carnal versus the spiritual and coming to the light of God. And he was in the middle of the greatest giving that God could give. Because that's the kind of God we have. He is a giving God. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world. That's the natural cosmos and everything that's in it that he gave his only begotten son. Somebody say gave. gave. There is in the scripture... Give, giver, gives, giving, gave. That subject comes up in the Holy Scripture, Old Testament, New, 1,555 times. Now, they, the church has taken things that have been spoken once and turned it into a doctrine. Offering and offerings. Would you like to know that one? is mentioned 1,082 times. Throw in the tithe and the tithes, it's 1,122 times. People say, yeah, but, you know, my salvation isn't based upon offerings. Yeah, it is. It's based upon His offering. God so loved He gave, and He sent the best that He had. That was the best offering that could have been given. And he gave it on your behalf for you, to you. And when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he just didn't die for you. He died as you. Amen. Don't try to catch that with your brain. That's a spirit thing, baby. He... Totally paid your payment for all, past, present, and future, because he hung there as you on Calvary. And the whole thing come crashing together at that point in time. Uh, the Apostle Paul said it th this way, when the fullness of time had come, the end of the world had come upon creation, God sent forth his son born of a woman. Pretty amazing right there. And in that act, the Word. What is the Word? Jesus. I'm telling you. He's the Word. Everything about it from beginning to end is about the Son of God. And what Papa was going to do through Him for us on our behalf. And the Word became flesh. That's, that's amazing. That component of God, the Word that brought everything into existence in the known visible universe, came forth now in the flesh. What an offering. Because He had to be made like us so that He could deliver us from the state that we were in, that fallen nature, and bring us back into right standing with God. And the only way He could do that is pay the price for us because he was the righteous one. Somebody say, Jesus, the righteous one.
And when we receive his offering, we become the righteousness of God in him. Based on performance, yes indeed, but it was all his performance, not yours. Why is it all about an offering? Because, because he was the offering. Can you imagine that if we could get a hold of this and we actually became the offering of God as Christ dwells in us? Doesn't that change everything? Join together so one with him that his heartbeat is our heartbeat. His thoughts become our thoughts. His love becomes our love. His forgiveness becomes our forgiveness. Forgiveness because, believe me, baby, there are some things that you won't forgive. It's just not in your natural makeup and man to do it. Or woman. But he can. Listen, I can't give to the degree... God did. If I had to give up one of my children for an old sinner, and I'm evangelistic too. Believe me, the old sinner is going to die. God bless Abraham. Thank God that he could find one that he would coin the father of faith that was willing to do it, having such a faith in God, knowing that that was the promised seed of his bloodline. But even if he sacrificed him, that God would raise him from the dead. You want to talk more about offering? Cain and Abel. Wait a minute, those are the sons of Adam from the beginning. But yet they were driven to give offerings. See, this is all way before law. And one wanted to do it his way. He wanted to give out of what he wanted to give God. And the other one gave the blood sacrifice. See, you see, you see, that was the shadow of Christ, the type of Christ, and God could accept that. Now, Cain could have redeemed himself. He was even told by God. But he got angry and he got jealous, and the, he let the anger rise up in all over an offering. Wow. In the Old Testament, they had different offerings for everything. They had grain offerings, they had meat offerings, they had burnt offerings, they had drink offerings, they had sin offerings. You could go down the list and look at all. And But you know what? In Christ, he paid it and did it all. We don't have to go through all that rigmarole. He delivered us from that. Yet, we struggle with 10%. And just, I'm not going to take anything for granted. And God told me not to do this. Oh, first I got to go back and confess to you. Because there's a lot of things, you know, I, I haven't talked on tithing and giving and offerings and laying down a foundation for this body of believers here. And the Lord told me, and he did it through confirmation of others. My uncle called me from Fresno. I'm in the middle of a conversation with God, and my phone rings, and it's my uncle. And he like hits me between the eyes with it. Here's the message that I got. Bonnie, whoever gave you the right to choose who you would hold accountable and who, and who you would release. If people don't bring the tithe and offerings in and if you don't teach them, who will? And if they're in disobedience to me because of a lack of understanding of what's required of them... Who's going to pay that account? Whoa, 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 wait a minute. And who ever said that when I have a deal between someone and you step in and say, oh, no, no, it's okay, don't worry about it, it's all good. Who gave you that right? So I repent, I confess, I apologize to you because... Tithe and offerings is something that is still required of believers. Is it contingent upon your salvation when it comes to the money part and everything? No, because he already paid that for you. 
But will it change your life and release the blessings of God on you? Yes, indeed. Will it change this entire church if we all begin to give? And tithe, by the way, is 10% of your earnings. Okay, let's just be straightforward with that. To get to the offerings, you've got to do the 10%. Because if you haven't done 10%, you haven't fulfilled the tithe obligation. Is that pretty simple for you? Okay. So then you get into the offerings. Okay. And then from there, you go into sacrifice. That's a word I didn't even run in this, this deal. I didn't run seed and sowing and sower and harvest and seed time and a whole range of other things that would fall into the same category, but we're already into the thousands. I mean, how, many, how, how much scripture do you need? See, I don't even know where to start at because it's such a huge thing, all, this whole thing about giving and receiving. And God has set up his entire kingdom on this giving and receiving principle because it's upside down from the world. In the world, we go out and try to earn our way. As a matter of fact, most of us spends most of our time trying to make a living and earn money. Look, that's not a bad thing to earn money. But to be enslaved to mammon is. Bob Dylan, you know, he, he, he wrote some good songs. But he kind of missed it on this one. And a lot of Christians like this. You're going to serve somebody. It's going to be the devil or it's going to be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. But that's not what the Bible said. God said, you're going to either serve God or mammon. He didn't say the devil because of the power of mammon. And mammon is the natural life and the natural wealth, but it doesn't stop there. It is... The hold that it gets on people and controls everything they do. You know the prisons and jails are full because people have a lack of money? Because people are controlled by mammon? And the mammon part is not just money, it is the need or the lust or the love of. How many, how many have heard... It's said that, that, that money is the root of all evil. That's not true. The Bible doesn't say that. It says the love or the lust for money is the root of all evil. Because money is what you make it. Money can be righteous and holy or it can be unrighteous mammon. It can be filthy lucre in the hands of some, even some believers. This is why this is such a serious matter. Can you guys still breathe? Everybody go... Whew. This is different than what I expected tonight. Well, good. It was supposed to be. You don't know how I've struggled to do this the way God wanted me to bring it. Well, maybe a couple of you do. <laughs> Are you ready for some scripture? Are you ready to hear some scripture that probably we've heard of many, many times? We need to get to the place where we trust God. It's one thing to believe in God, and a whole other thing to trust in Him. We believe that God can do all things. Yes, but do you trust Him to do it for you? You see, when you put the trust part in, it changes everything. I believe God can do things, but am I willing to step out on the water? Am I willing to get out of the boat? Am I going to trust in God and do what his command says? Look, the whole point is coming into a right standing with God. Because I want to be in his good standing. I want to be in the righteousness. And to step into the greatest gift that God has ever given is the best thing that we could ever do. But that's only the beginning because there is a conduct that takes place in our life. In other words, the things that we do and the places that we go and how we think and the things that we speak all of a sudden begin to change. All of a sudden, it's walking out our salvation. In other words, it's the conduct and it's living the life uh, instead of just talking about it or just believing in it. We're actually putting actions to the things that we believe in and that's trusting in God. You believe that God will heal somebody, but when you go up to a total stranger on the street and obey God and lay hands on him and command healing, yep. even if it makes you look like a fool and an idiot. Yep. And by the way, being a fool and an idiot isn't all that bad. It's 
You know, I'm going to be an idiot. I better do it for God. I, I've been an idiot long enough for the darkness. <laughs> Man, I got somebody right there. <laughs> Don't raise your hands. Just say amen. amen. <laughs> Malachi 3.1. And here's the thing about some of this scripture. I just want to expose some stuff because some, some people say that, oh, tithing and offerings is of the law. Well, I've already proven that it was before. As a matter of fact, Abraham, before the law was ever written through Moses, gave a tithe till Melchizedek, which was a shadow of Christ. Okay? So the spiritual tithe exists in and there is the the because the levitical priesthood that's what they were all about and they received the tithe and all the offerings from all the people and uh that was done in accordance to the law but you see this greater law is in effect which is the spiritual law of giving and receiving which the kingdom of heaven is based upon in the upside down kingdom it's not what you acquire but it's what you're willing to give up and what you're willing to give away that adds to your wealth can you take money into the eternals? Absolutely you can. But you got to send it now. You can't wait until that day. Where your heart is, there your treasure is also. All right, you ready? Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly... Come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So for this to be in the law, yet he's talking about the messenger of the covenant, which is Jesus, and he's bringing it forth. We're talking about the new day. Let's see if we can continue and prove this but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears for he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap huh. isn't it Isaiah who said come let us reason though your sins be as scarlet I will make them white as snow we're talking about that blood that was poured out through Jesus, the, the bringer of the covenant, who, by the way, not only brought the covenant and fulfilled the covenant and then died so the covenant or his testament could come into full effect, but he raises on the third day and becomes the testator of his own covenant to see that it's carried out according to his purpose and his plan and even now sets at the right hand of the Father making sure that it's done the right way. Because this covenant is just not you, it's between Father God and Son and you can't goof it up whether you believe it or receive it or want it or not. So we're talking about a new day in the Old Testament. And he will set as a refiner's fire and purify the silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi. Ooh, he's talking about the priests. And he will purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. I want all your offerings to be in righteousness. Well, how do we do that? By letting... Jesus live big in you because he is the son of righteousness. There's healing in his wings, by the way, if you didn't know that. And when you're overshadowed by him, you're in his righteousness. And everything that you do in accordance to his plan is righteous. It's good and it's perfect and with right standing. My goodness. Even your thoughts. Quit struggling with the memories of an old man and just look under your bed. And if they are, you better kick them out. Why would you want a corpse in your house anyway? A corpse starts stinking after a while and starts rotting. Why would you go up in your backyard and dig up that old man and strap him on your back and carry him around? So, does it feel good to have that flesh there? I would much rather walk in the Spirit. I would much rather be clean 
and be free and have the aroma of the presence of God around me. I tell you, there is no smell like that smell. Not only does he smell good, he tastes good. He says, taste and see the Lord is good. It's like honey. <laughs> All right, okay. That he may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. So this whole thing is about offering. Through the Lord. Through the bringer of the covenant. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem, or the people of God, will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Malachi 3.6 For I am the Lord, and I change not. Why would he say that right there? Everybody's wanting to change him. And that was grace to them. Therefore you will not be consumed, O sons of Jacob. Thank God for that. And it's funny, the wording of Jacob there too. Because he involves all of them. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and you have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. But in what way shall we return? Do you know... With understanding and in the spirit, you could have read, read this or heard this preached or, or heard it quoted a thousand times. And then in light of the spirit, all of a sudden it takes on a brand new meaning. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithe and offerings. So back to my first point, how can you pay to God? what's already his. You know, this probably would be a good time to reinsert it's not law, but it's relationship. And the thing is, we need to come and just fall in love with him. Because you know, the ones that I love, I don't hold anything back from them. 10%. My goodness, the government takes at least 30 to 40, and if you're rich, they take up to 60 or 70, which makes no good sense to me, because 10% of a million is a lot more than a 10% of a thousand. So I think that's injustice to the people who are entrepreneurial and raise the money. As a matter of fact, that is against the kingdom of God to do that and penalize the people who are producers and entrepreneurs of money, because they are the ones that create wealth and create jobs. That's why in the scripture, Jesus tells the story about the talents that he gives one to one, five to another, and ten to another. And the one who had five and the one who had ten doubled theirs, but the one who had one went and hid his and didn't do anything with it because he didn't want to lose it. And so the master says, take from him he who didn't produce and give it to the one who has the most. That's the principles of the kingdom of God. You want to bury your talent? You want to hoard it away? And when I say that, listen, I'm not beating you up. I'm trying to get you to the place where you understand to fall in love with him so it's not a hardship. It's not a struggle. It's not something that when you, oh no, it's offering time, here it comes. It should be, mama, Mike, it's time to give back something to the Lord. And I do that gleefully with joy. How, what did the Apostle Paul say about the attitude? Because God loves a cheerful giver. giver. And, and it's pretty simple in this, that we do what we're prepared to do. Because the things that I'm not prepared to do, I usually don't do. That's why I prepare. Can I just really get mean right now? You know... You, 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 go, you go visit a church, and, and you'll hear the pastor say, Now, if you're a visiting from another church, don't, you don't have, you're not required to put any offering in, you know, in our buckets. And for, for goodness sakes, don't put your tithe in. Well, I, I kind of agree with the tithe. Tithe should support your local ministries and your local church. But should we tell people not to give an offering in a thriving ministry? As a matter of fact, listen... If you go visit a church, I want you to be like me. Every time I go visit a church, I prepare in my heart to give an alm and an offering in their bucket because I don't want any bucket ever going by me that I'm not going to give in. Why would I do that? 
And I should be a blessing to a, vi a church that I'm visiting anyway. If I'm visiting them, I must believe in something they're doing. Huh? So if we're going to visit churches, shouldn't we take an offering with us? And people do what their pastors tell them. That they, they learn through that. And I want a church that's... People love it when we show up. Here they come! Instead of, oh my God. <laughs> Be hilarious, joyous givers. <laughs> and I wish that we could do the Matrix thing, you know, where he plugs in, download, I know Kung Fu. I mean, if it was that easy, that would be cool. But it's not. We learn and go through a process. My goodness, the first time I started giving tithe, it was a sacrifice. It was beyond offering. Just to get to the 10% was the, the, how could I afford to do this? But it didn't take long to prove to me how could I afford not to do it. I know I've never gone on this long about giving. Isn't it great? <laughs> so we found out we robbed God. And he said, you are cursed with a curse because you have robbed me, this whole nation. And then he says to him, bring all the tithes. What does that mean? That means everything. Whatever you have income in. Whether it's your cash, whether it's your gold stash, whether it's your crops, whether it's your grains, whether it's your mint and cumin, it doesn't matter what it is. Bring the tithes. Because you've got to remember, tithe is singular. All right? 10%. How can you have tithes out of tithes? Well, if you've got 10% of more of this and 10% of that, that's how you get tithes out of tithe. Does that make sense? Just a little word ex explanation there. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. Wait a minute. God doesn't put that out any other place in the scripture from Genesis to Revelation to put him to the test. Yet when it comes to giving, it's like God is compelled to tell people, hey, go ahead. I want to prove to you that I am the God of abundance, that I am the God of more, and if you bring into my house, I'm going to bring into your house. Amen. Now listen to this, because I'm going to read it the way it is translated, and then I'm going to take the words that's not in the original out, and I'll see which one makes more sense. Can we do that? Okay. That there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out such blessing that there will not be, that there will not be room enough to receive it. Has anybody ever received that much? You have? John, where's my cut? <laughs> Saying, because I never got there yet. I have been, my socks have been blessed off. Blessed, but I have always had room in my bank account and in my wallet. Well, i got two wallets now, but you see, I can still receive it. You hear what, you hear what I'm saying? I'm being really real right here. Because that doesn't, the translator's goofed up here or something, because that doesn't make any sense. Let me read it and remove the words that the translator's added that's not even in the original writing. You ready? This is what it says with the words removed that isn't in the original uh, Hebrew. And see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you blessing. That not enough, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Hey, whoa, 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 that just changed everything. In other words, if you give, he's going to open the windows of heaven and pour you out blessing. And if that's not enough, then he's going to rebuke the devourer for your sake so that you... So that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor the, the vine fail to bear fruit in your field, says the Lord of hosts. Hmm, I think the translator's messed up there. So, anyway, if you do this for God, he'll do that for you. And make no mistake, you cannot outgive God. 
What, is, what, did, what did Jesus say in Luke 6.38? Give, and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, and running over, shall it be given back into your bosom. Say, so, okay, I'll receive that. But you see, there's requirement. We've got to become the givers. But let's, okay, my whole thing, I, I want you to understand this. My whole objective here is not to get you to tithing. My objective is to get you to loving. Because if we got tithers in the house, tithers is great because their checks is like $143.56. It's nice because they give and they're consistent. I love it. But look here. A lover will do whatever it takes. Because, you know, and I, and I was even going to write a book about it because when God, I've you know, never written one of the five books that I've got in me. But it was arenas of giving and it starts out with a tither, you know. And it's like, a tither's like the salt shaker because it just gives what it needs to. And that's it. But then you go into the offerings, and then you go into the sacrificial giving. But then you go into a place called sowing, because you start understanding the dynamics of the kingdom of heaven, and you understand here a little, and there a little, and you sow in this role, and in that role, because you don't know what's going to produce. And pretty soon you got crops coming up everywhere, and you got other people reaping your harvest. That's the way the kingdom of heaven is. But then you move into a whole nother arena. Where God started with God so loved. That's what I'm talking about. The loving relationship. And if you're struggling with giving a nickel, then fall in love with Jesus. Remind yourself of what he's given for you. My goodness. Talk about laying some new foundation here. It's going to take a while. But I think we can get there. You all, you think so? Is it all, is it all right if we... Uh, change some things. I'm not even going to be able to get to this really important stuff that I had. I knew that was going to happen. And I won't try to give it all out to you at once. See, meet people are already moving around, so we're going, to, we're going to do something. We're not going to change this. I like the vessels up here and everything. But we're going to actually serve you. And we got ushers and everything. We're going to put more people to work. I think this is fantastic. And what I'm going to do is you sow your seed in confidence, knowing that God's word is true. Because my scripture says that it's impossible for God to lie. And I'm not talking, you know, those of you who are givers in, in, in this ministry, my goodness, a handful of people in this ministry support everything that we do. But I think that it needs to change. I think that we all begin to support so that we've got, we've got something no matter what happens and we can begin to increase mini ministry and go to the more and do for the more and love more people. Don't you guys see that? And I believe that's the way to go. So as you, as, you, as you allow the Lord to speak to your heart right now, and you prepare that, that offering, I speak blessing over you, and I come into a covenant agreement with you right now that God will open up the windows of heaven. And as a matter of fact, remember what I said about if we could just get so Christ-minded that we would be the offering? Like he was the offering. It says it right there in Malachi. That he will pour you out the blessing. Do you understand that? He will pour you out the blessing. You become the blessing and the offering in God's hands that he pours out. I think I got that. It'll come to you in the middle of the night. Patrick, come on. We're not going to say any more because I probably danced all over your sermon. Oh, great.